Good day, good evening, and uh, welcome uh, for our uh, fifth event in this uh, series, Sessions on Territory, Urbanism and the Anthropocene, with the focus on ecology. This is a, a lecture series uh, that is organized by teams of uh, Mark Angelil and myself, and uh, I would like to thank Sasha Deltz, Hans Hortig, and behind the camera, Jörg Stovins, for uh, realizing this program. So, uh, a few words about our uh, uh, curated uh, events this autumn. Um, um, I would uh, like to propose that this uh, lecture series is actually uh, beside being on territory, Anthropocene, ecology, etc., it's, uh, it's actually on urbanism, it's on future of urbanism, on the practice that, uh, uh, that we are concerned with uh, and teach in this school. Um, as part of architecture, architects' education, as part of practice, what should be the features, what should be the concerns of urbanistic practice in the future. Uh, urbanism in this context is used as a term that replaces or that stands in for a wide range of other terms that marks uh, practices of uh, urban design, urban and territorial research, um, different um, spatial practices, uh, such as uh, activism and artistic work concerned with urban space. Uh, with urbanism, we also mean um, a kind of a revision of practice, the interest in scales that are beyond the city. We mean the broadening of perspective from cities to urbanizing territories and to even planet as a whole, so those scales that are highlighted in the process of planetary urbanization. And we started this series more than a year ago, first uh, uh, in uh, 2017, with two cycles of uh, sessions on territory that were um, realized under the heading Urbanism Beyond Neoliberalism. And in these uh, cycles, we first considered urbanism uh, in the late 20th and 21st centuries in relation to political economic transformations that uh, we are faced in um, in our practice. We thought about uh, shrinking public sector, shrinking state, and how those um, um, transformations are reshaping the work and the profession of architect urbanist. And in those uh, uh, responses, we had 10 different speakers um, who proposed uh, a different uh, modes of practice, among them uh, Jennifer Robinson, Stefano Boeri, and Moyo Kaima. And uh, now, in the second cycle, we are focusing on um, the notions of Anthropocene and ecology. So how are those uh, fields, uh, how are those forces constitutive of the practice of an architect urbanist in the 21st century? I uh, would like to note that during the 20th century, uh, the environmental or ecological critique did not perhaps leave a, a mark <laughs> on architecture to the extent that it should have. We, of course, uh, have a history of uh, influential positions uh, from uh, Doxiadis to Buckminster Fuller. Um, uh, we have many uh, influential um, um, concepts, positions, but uh, this is still a field uh, through which we uh, um, hope to be able to uh, redefine, uh, redef reinvent the agency of design, of urban and territorial design uh, in the future. So, 
in this uh, um, along these lines it is a great pleasure to welcome today Uz from Rotterdam um, Eva Fannes and Sylvan Hartenberg who will uh, present uh, waterworks. Uh, I would like to introduce Eva and Sylvan also as collaborators and friends. Uh, for many years, we just uh, recounted probably nearly 20 years that uh, we've had uh, uh, a dialogue and conversation in uh, in Rotterdam in the um, events such as uh, Dutch Prix de Rome. And uh, I would like to, uh, uh, let's say, personally uh, remember the kind of a path of, of uh, uh, Eva and Sylvan as uh, an office who, in a highly original way, I think, integrated ecological questions into their practice, and in particular, uh, uh, for example, the, the problematic of water. So uh, uh, I look uh, uh, extremely um, 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 also with a, with a kind of personal excitement to the look forward to their talk. So let me uh, also uh, mention a few uh, more uh, uh, formal points in their CV. Eva and Sylvan are operating in the fields of art, architecture and urbanism. Their work explores how our lives and cities can be more synchronized with nature and combines an elaborate understanding of natural ecological processes with technological expertise and deep insights into sociocultural behavior. Their work has been realized, exhibited and recognized worldwide. For example, in the Dutch Prix de Rome uh, context, as well, uh, they are recipients of the UK Landscape Institute Award for Best Design for a Temporary Landscape in 2017, and for their ongoing projects on sanitations of informal settlements in Rio de Janeiro, they have been awarded uh, a highly prestigious Lafarge Holtzim Award, Bronze Award in 2017 for Latin America, and uh, Edward Schwartz from Lafarge Holzing Foundation is also with us in the audience tonight. Uh, Eva and Sylvan have been tutors at the Eindhoven Design Academy and in 2015 practitioners in residence at Central St. Martin's College in London. They are currently working on water as leverage program of the Dutch government and 100 resilient cities in Chennai as well as developing a strategy for the Dutch countryside. And uh, let me also say that after Eva and Sylvan's talk, I will also have a pleasure to introduce another old friend, Professor Dilik Hebel, uh, now from the uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. But first, help me in welcoming Eva, Fannes and Sylvan Hartenberg of US. Um, thank you, Milica, for the invitation. Thank you, Mark, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. And dear students, thank you for being here um, to listen to what we have to say about our own work, which is uh, interesting always to reflect on that. So please note down the questions. We're very curious about your remarks. I would like to start with a quote of... Um, or read David uh, Thoreau from 1860. What is the use of a house if you haven't got a tolerable planet to put it on? So he puts it already in 1860. In, he puts the house in relation to the planet. Interestingly, the work house um, comes from the Greek oikos. And the management of the house relates to the management to the household and management of nature, which is ecology. The house itself hasn't changed much in many centuries. Um, they last a long time and they can accommodate various functions. Um, the intention is still the same, it's to provide shelter. However, the flows in and out of houses have changed greatly and the planet that houses the houses has also changed greatly. The landscape beyond is out of balance and that's because 
of a development that is linear, of extracting, polluting and dumping. So we are in the age of the Anthropocene. And I guess, yeah, that's why we are interested in infrastructure as, as the, and the flows of resources. Infrastructure is connecting individuals to each other. It's connecting individuals to common resources. And so it defines the nature of commonality. So the projects we're talking about today is mostly about water. You see here three balls. Probably one is so small you can't even see it. That is the amount of all water we have on Earth. That is the amount of sweet water we have available, and that's inside and on the surface. And that is the amount of potable water we have available. Um, in our practice, we work a lot, so Milica introduced it also as we work in art together, mostly with Milica Potrich, an artist from Ljubljana. We develop what we call urban prototypes, and that relates then to our practice of urban strategies. So where we extrapolate the knowledge we learn from actually on-site in mostly quite short time, like each project takes sometimes a year, sometimes longer, um, so we get results quite quickly. So today I'm going to show two of those and two urban strategies. I'm going to start with the Emscher Kunst between the waters, the Emscher Community Garden, which is an on-site installation commissioned by the um, Emscher Genossenschaft in 2010, and it was put up again in 2013. Florian Matzner curated an island for the arts, so that is about 50 kilometer long in the Ruhr area. Um, it's a sort of artificial island um, flanked by um, an open sewage, which is the Emscher and the Rheinherne Canal. And then in between, we, were, we got carte blanche, so we were looking for a site where both rivers are extremely close together, only 80 meters apart. So you have here an open sewage canal, which is very rare in Germany, and the Rheinherne Canal, which is very clean water separated by a fence, so you actually cannot go to this water normally. We were interested in the dialectic between those two waters and started to think about a, a, a possibility to connect them in a single line that is 80 meter long and 5 meter wide and is actually a treatment system that works only with water from the area. It starts with a toilet, then it's a septic tank, a pump sump, a constructed wetland, so that is the plant filter that treats the water, a rainwater collecting roof, a collection for the rain and the cleaned water, community garden, and eventually an activated carbon drinking water filter that um, filters this whole water and renders it drinkable. So it's a kind of really close cycle, and it works with solar cells that are here on the roof that power three pumps. One pump is in the Emscher River and pumps this like sewage into this blue ball, which is a septic tank, where it's combined with the sewage from the toilet. And then it's with a timer pumped every six hours into the 60 square meter of halophyte filter. And at the same time, it collects the rain. And so you can see here already what we learned, which is that our community garden was too large for the amount of water we were able to collect and generate. And that is so something interesting. You see also between the first slide and the second that it did change a lot. And that is because in this slide, when we presented it to the engineers, they said, this is absolutely impossible. <laughs> like you dreaming, we can't do any of this. Because in fact, this dam next to the Emscher River is protecting all the surrounding area, which is extremely dense, it's the most dense area in Germany, from flooding. And so we had to use an old retaining wall to create here a bridge cantilevering structure that cantilevers 18 meters, so we can get as close as possible, and we can really get close to the smell without seeing it. So you see here the closed loop system from the toilet combined with the river, the filter, the rain, the storage, community garden, and then pumped back. This is the toilet. It was important to 
to make everything, to make the whole system visible so that people can actually understand it. It's not rocket science, but it's very simple. You see here the toilet, you see actually the daughter of um, the curators which curated the project, which became our next project. So it was the first time she used the toilet in her life. And what you cannot see is that this whole cantilever was very bouncy, so it was very exciting. And um, you see here also how much the plants, um, these halophyte plants that we're using, how much they love the sewage. So you have a difference from, of three months in between. And this is the water storage in the beginning. Um, let's say it didn't last very long because people loved it too much and it got damaged pretty quickly. Um, could also call it vandalism. And so in the end, we had to protect it with some steel plates. This is the community garden where people brought plants, um, permaculture plants. We had a gardener. And we have the drinking water filter, with, um, which of course raised a lot of um, um, issues. Like people who come, they usually don't want to drink the water. And some do after a while. They challenge themselves. Because in fact, what's happening is nothing else than what's happening in a big treatment station as well. We also made beer, because beer is also an ancient method to clean water. Um, so we made beer from the sewage, <laughs> which is interesting. And <laughs> so it, what was nice actually in this project is how this act of bringing water to a place created a place. And that people got together, they had a reason to get together, and even people who could do nothing with art who actually passed by and said art is a waste of taxpayers' money. They said, oh, finally, we have a toilet, so at least <laughs> we can use that. And so this started a conversation, and it started a conversation also about many issues about Anthropocene that people have in their minds, but they usually don't dare to ask each other. The next project is of Soil and Water, the King's Cross Pond Club. Um, it was curated by the Relay Art Program, commissioned by the King's Cross Limited Partnership, um, together with the um, developer Argent. M um, Michael Pinsky and Stephanie Delcroix were the curators. Um, we were part of a group of four artists, um, together with Jacques Rival, Felice Varini, and Richard Wentworth with Gruppe and which over a span of four years, every year one temporary project during the making of this biggest uh, redevelopment site in Europe. Right now they started actually with um, Central St. Martins, which is here, in order to attract a lot of life and students, and right now they're finishing it off with building the Google headquarters by um, Big and um, Heatherwick. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> So when we started, that was in 2010, 2011, um, the site looked like this. So you have St. Pancras and King's Cross. You have the Regents Canal flowing through and you have the Camley Street Natural Park. And those became the three elements that inspired us. Again, we got carte blanche. Um, we could do what we want. We got a certain budget. And we decided to do something with these three elements that are already on site, the Regents Canal and the dynamic of this huge building site that is a city in the making, which projects in a way the imaginary. And so we wanted to insert a small empty enclave within this imaginary where we would make use of all the like um, roughness and all the let's say, city in the making that we found. So soil as something that is beyond real estate value. And so this picture here um, was published on the 1st of April, um, together with the name of the project manager of the developer, which was Ian Freshwater, and an office called Ooze. And so everybody thought this must be an April joke. It's impossible. <laughs> And um, so people actually didn't believe it was possible to have a swimming pond without any chemicals. It's a microecological environment that um, works only with plants. 
and surrounded by a pioneer landscape that um, reflects the soil cycle from a very meager soil to a, to a very rich soil where eventually even trees could grow. So all that happens on this side. I'm going to explain first the soil cycle. So we had here, we had um, an area where we actually did nothing. So that was just this very rough side soil. Then we had a drier area, a humid area, an area with n normal soil, and then a very rich meadow and some shrubs. For that, we, had, um, we worked together with some specialists on wild planting. We had 80 different types of wild plants. And wild plants are not something, that's why they're not like cultured plants. They actually look for their environment, and it's very hard to make them grow somewhere. So this was really an experiment to try to repopulate the city and the rather groomed environment with plants that have been pushed outside. And so that was really interesting because sometimes it worked, some plants liked it, some others uh, left after a couple of months, some others got sick. And a lot of people from the, a lot of students from Central St. Martins, but also just inhabitants that passed by during our three planting by days, started to, to willingly to help because they just, um, also older people remember this type of plants. And so that was um, around um, May. So that was a quite cold year. And that was how we opened the pond. And that was really interesting to convince the developer that this is actually okay. That it's okay to have uh, nature in the, in the process and that we don't have to have a green carpet everywhere. After uh, three months in summer, it looked like this. We had um, a swimming pond, which was not heated. This is uh, in July. And what you cannot see here is, of course, the noise of the surrounding building site. Um, a, a big wild swimming community started to appear. And that is a sort of a spot of tranquility within the site. We also designed the logo. We have, um, big, as I said, in London, what we didn't um, think about before is the swimming community, which swimming cold waters is extremely strong. So we have people which swim in the River Thames. Um, <laughs> and um, even though the water was mostly 10 degrees, still a strong community formed around it. I seem to have forgotten, actually, the slides which explain the treatment of the water. <laughs> so I'm going to go back and explain it here. Um, what you see is three areas. So this is the swimming area, which is 25 meter. Then you have an oxygenation area. And then you have a mineral filter. So that is a kind of sand and small stones with a, with a similar planting, but still a little bit different than the treatment of the sewage. And around it, you have skimmers and pumps. So everything is visible, so people could, again, follow this process. We have also boards where we explain the processes that happen. Because in the swimming pond, we could only have 163 people per day. And that is because that's exactly the amount that nature can deal with. That's 3.6 cube meter per person. So we had to make the pond here deep enough to cater for this volume because otherwise the whole operation is not worthwhile if you have even more. And so it was necessary to also explain to people why uh, it is this limited number. And we had, of course, the press, uh, Daily Mirror, etc. in the beginning. They were worried that the water will turn yellow and um, all these kind of nightmare stories, which, of course, didn't happen. And so eventually the pond got a big group of followers um, because it's such a huge difference. I mean, here in Switzerland, you have, of course, the Zürichsee. Um, you have all the rivers, which are so pristine. But people in London, they don't have all that. They're completely remote. This is the pond in autumn. And again, we started a new, uh, uh, an extended narrative with the developer that is to leave all the plants to die 
because all those plants harvest, uh, house a lot of wildlife, a lot of bees, a lot of wasps, a lot of insects find their home here during the winter. And it was very important to keep up this aesthetic, which is not normally seen on such a site. We <laughs> In the end, so that is after 18 months, um, somebody started a petition um, which raised 4,300 signatures to keep the pond alive. They were even ready to, um, they started a splash mob and they were ready to maintain, to finance the pond. And nevertheless, eventually, the pond had to close down. And we've, we, we realized that, or people didn't actually realize that it was a private development, that it looked so public, but it was a private site. Maybe we can talk about that later on, about this dilemma. And even though they went to um, the Camden Council and tried their best, it was impossible to keep it for longer because the developer thinks extremely long term. And what was nice that you have a user group of people from all walks of life. You have disabled people, blind people, depressed people. You have a clown who came every week um, in before an audition in order to focus because the cold water um, makes you do that. The cold water is actually antidepressive because your body gets a shock and through this adaptation also your mind learns to adapt. So there's a lot of benefits which are not immediately apparent. Now I'm going to talk about the urban strategies um, which are in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo and, and Chennai in India. The project Agua Carioca and then after some years Agua Paulista, we started in 2012. We went to Rio and we showed them some of these artworks which we had done. Um, because we visited since many years and eventually we thought it would be interesting to start to work. And the municipality got very excited, but then they said, we don't have money. So we can help you with all sort of other resources. But um, we went then to the Dutch government, which has a very good funding system for innovative projects, especially connecting creative industry to the water industry. And so we got our first grant to conduct a large research which would eventually produce a documentary and an exhibition. So everything you see here is also our own research, our own pictures. That is um, some of the people we have spoken to. If you're interested, you can watch the documentary online. It's called Aqua Carioca Diarios. And so that is people, community leaders, that is people from the municipality. It's Pedro Rivera from um, Studio X, from uh, Chisap, Columbia University. Um, it is um, um, technicians, it is activists. Um, and through that, through their voices actually, we constructed the documentary. That is how most people here think about Rio. It's the beach, the famous beaches, Ipanema, Copacabana. And that is the Mata Atlantica, the biggest rainforest, um, the biggest urban rainforest in the world. And the rivers are coming here out crystal clear. And after just a few kilometers, they look like this. So something happens in between, and this something is the organism which we call city. So we thought it would be interesting to start exactly there and to understand also how big is the disaster. This is um, 6.5 million people living around the bay generate 20,000 liters of human waste per second that flow into the bay. Um, they have a standard treatment system, which is called the Emissario Submarino, an underground pipeline um, that comes out five kilometers outside of the famous beaches, and it filters the water just with a primary treatment. And of course, as the city grows, this is not a sustainable system. The solution the city till now um, introduced is what we all know. It's this big standard sewage treatment stations which are outside the city and which in Rio de Janeiro, even though this is supposed to be the largest of its kind in Latin America, 
it's only working at 30% of its capacity because the sewers are simply not connected to it. So this is something, in fact, akin to have all our organs outside the body. Um, and we started comparing urban metabolism to human metabolism and wouldn't it be smarter to integrate the organs again inside the body to save energy, to save transport, to use less. And so we looked, we looked also because sewage is something that nobody wants to talk about, it's always ugly and dirty, so we looked at how our human body, our lungs, our kidneys are actually very beautiful and how we could put that in relation to a more closed cycle. So here we have the house, the house with a washing machine, a shower, a person, which generates a certain amount of wastewater that goes into a, a septic tank, which separates the particles from the liquids, and that gets filtered by this constructed wetland, which works like this, that you have a pebble um, layer of 10 centimeter, then you have roughly one meter of sand, and you have plants which produce oxygen on their roots, and that's why the bacteria that are already in our body like to stay there, and that are processes that start, in a way, a large food chain, from smaller bacteria to bigger ones, to protozoa, to worms, to birds, etc. So the water that comes out here is clean but not drinkable and can be reused for irrigation or washing machine or washing cars, other purposes. So this system here, we looked at how we can make that in a way into a systemic urban approach and how we can apply this to different scales. So that would be, this would be to a school. This is a number of houses, 10 to 15, which each have a septic tank. They receive fresh water from the mountains, so the potable water comes from the mountains directly, and then this shared wastewater flows through these filters so that the rivers in the communities are clean instead of dirty. And then this can be upscaled, put together, and it creates a public space next to the river that used to be dirty before. So we looked at a kind of fractal approach from a one building to 150 to 620,000 houses and eventually made a speculative approach um, for the whole bay. We looked at a school in Marais neighborhood that is a favela of around 100,000 people. We looked at two neighborhoods, uh, Mojo da Formiga and Mojo dos Alguero, which are in the Tishuca Mountains. So the picture of the forest you saw is this patch here. And we looked at Rio das Pedras, which is in the Baja region. So that's where the Olympic Games also were, which is here, which is a favela of also 90,000 inhabitants. The school is a prefab school by Oskar Niemeyer. You have around um, 900 of those. This is the neighborhood, and you have here a system which um, there are varying um, opinions of who built that system, if it's the municipality or the people themselves, but clear is that water gets polluted and nobody knows anymore what is dirty and what is clean. And that is the Formiga neighborhood, where you have this... Um, relatively beautiful river here flowing through, which the more it goes down, the more, more polluted it is. And the municipality, they had a good program in the 90s, but since then they didn't do anything anymore. And even now when we spoke to them, they said, yeah, but we did something already. So we spoke to people and now we actually, in the next slides here, you see how we turned these diagrams into actual designs, how we worked with the numbers we got from engineers and how we looked here at the school, how we could devise that so it could be fun for children to participate, so the septic tank becomes a little continent, um, the constructed wetland, which is very large, is totally visible, the water pipe frames a football field, the pavilion, which is the water storage, becomes um, an educational pavilion and we have the, the garden where they can grow vegetables. And so this is one vision of the neighborhood. 
So here we have a very advanced system where the water that flows in from the mountains flows through the house. It becomes dirty. You see the, the septic tanks. You see the constructed wetland. And then it works entirely by gravity. So the water could be reused by the group of houses below and so forth. So that works also, people always say there is no space, but that's actually not true because much of these spaces here are littered with waste. Um, you have some favelas where they just throw the trash out of the window. And so this leads to an ongoing cycle, um, which could be broken only by, by making something else in the public space, which could be this constructed wetland. And here you see very interestingly the analogy with the human lung or kidneys, which are in between, so that this waterfall actually becomes clean again. And here, Rio das Pedras, so this is this very dense neighborhood where we want to turn around the flow and create in this um, mangrove wetlands that are around it, create the constructed wetlands so that the lagoon itself becomes clean. This is Rio das Pedras at the moment. So you have here the, the riverside. You have here this really totally black water. And that is how it could become. And that is also how water, how actually resources, um, investments that are used for infrastructure could eventually be used to um, help develop the public space. Because usually for culture, there is a lot less money than for infrastructure. Um, this is in Salguero, so here you see how those um, constructed wetlands with the tropical plants are directly integrated in the neighborhoods. Um, our design strategy is to, have to identify the elements, so we have the water challenge. What we need is a water tank, a septic tank and a wetland, and each one could be designed in many different ways so that um, it could become uh, a playground, a tribune, a roof, or a viewing platform. And then in the combination of the elements, that's where we form the public space, and we add other functions like garbage, solar, solar energy, and food production to it. And so this is kind of what you saw just before in the Formiga neighborhood. And so we... Um, we also had a communication strategy with this, that is, we made um, a big exhibition twice, um, in Studio X the first time, in the CTO Roberto Bolle Marx the second time, and we built models for each of the projects, so that people would actually, I mean, the feedback we got was, oh wow, you didn't change the favela itself at all. And that was actually interesting to take this as a status quo, and to just do the things that are actually not working because building houses is usually not such a big problem for the people. And this one is a more abstract model which really visualizes um, these flows. And then we have Rio das Pedras. And that is the, so each of the drawings you saw was printed on a very large wooden panel and that is within the CTO Roberto Bolle Marx, where we made our pilot project. This is um, a collage drawing where you see all these wonderful um, kind of animals and protozoa and bacteria and worms, which create this amazing soup, um, which eventually cleans the water. This is the plants in the city of Roberto Bolle Marx. Roberto Bolle Marx was one of the most famous landscape designers um, in Brazil. He worked a lot with uh, Niemeyer. So he designed all the river front, the, the seafront in Rio de Janeiro. And he also, um, around his own house, he had a nursery of uh, plants. He went to the Amazon to collect plants. Um, he became a, one of the first ecologists of Brazil. And here you see the, the tropical halophyte plants with these amazing roots. So we worked with some of the gardeners that still worked for Roberto Bolle Marx to find those plants within their, their garden. And so this became the prototype, which is a new toilet for around 20 gardeners, um, a septic tank, 
an organic filter organico, so that's the constructed wetland, and the water tank that collects the water from the guest house that Bourle Marx des designed for his brother. And so these are in a constant uh, flow. Now this is just a few photos from the building process and we had to take care that we don't touch any of the roots of the existing plants. So somehow these organic shapes were partly designed on site around the rocks, around the trees. Um, we had an <laughs> incident with the septic tank at the end where we built on a rock, but the rock proved to be permeable, so we had to seal it afterwards. Um, <laughs> Silva had to go inside. You see here how this uh, wetland is constructed. So he's actually standing on this uh, one meter layer of sand. You see here the gravel and you see the pipes which have a hole every um, half a meter. So the, the sewage which is pumped from the red tank can actually come out here and dripple down slowly. And so Again, you see here the communication strategy to label each element to actually make the path visible between the elements so people become aware of it. So that is me smelling, if you can <laughs> smell anything. Um, you see the elements. And then we painted the section for the wetland. And so we used it to explain various stakeholder groups, to explain to students. Um, we had some sessions with Studio X, with some students from Studio X. We had some sessions with the municipality, with the Museo do Amanya, which all came to, to, to see how it's, it's actually working. And so even though this was in 2016 and we had the first exhibition already in 2014 and we realized there were many misconceptions. So without the prototype, some people were actually expecting a lake because it's called constructed wetlands. And so that is the exhibition. Um, next step was that we worked with some interested people on a implementation strategy. So that goes from a project initiation to a collaborative design phase to a collective effort to identify also who could build it, which technicians, which um, regulation is necessary to a local management and multiplication strategy. So this involves, uh, you see the blue is the public sector. These are the experts and this is the community. So we see ourselves as part of the experts. And so um, to, to think about financing became, in this whole self-initiated project, became a very important part. To also think about all the externalities that um, this project is generating and that would only flow back later on. So this is actually, for instance, the improved health, the higher economic productivity and the healthier ecosystem is something that comes back much later, whereas the local benefits, um, environmental education, um, the sanitation service, 50% less of water consumption, a better community cohesion, all these are immediately felt. So this is um, a strategy over time, so from uh, the situation of the bay at the moment to pilot programs, so that is in the four different neighborhoods, to a pioneer uptake to eventually a city norm. So how long this process takes, we still have to find out. Um, and so these are the various factors. Water consumption would go down. I mean, when we did, for instance, when we did the, the pilot um, project, this was also just... Um, during the Olympic Games and in the year before, there was a huge drought and the, the fact that the waters are polluted became a lot more known, even in, in newspapers in the Western world. And so the, con the, the reception was totally different than in 2014. So sometimes, in this case, time was on our side. So this idea of a decentralized strategy that works only with water that is available um, directly or where possible, could also have an impact on other sectors like energy, garbage and food. And in 2017, we got invited by uh, Marcos Hosa, 
who I believe has also worked here at the ETH uh, to participate in the um, bi Biennial of Architecture in Sao Paulo. And we started um, with an analysis of the hydrological system. I'm going to go not so much into detail as with the first project. So we analyzed in a way how much water is actually used and how much it is raining. So that's a direct connection. This 50% of inhabitants in Sao Paulo, which is around 6 million, um, have a collection and a treatment. 30% have only a collection and 20% have nothing. So that's 2.4 million people uh, where you can, whether you build around 5,500 kilometer of large sewer pipes or you build 2.5 square kilometer of constructed wetlands. So when we made that drawing, that's when actually the municipality and the water company became interested because of economical reasons. And that is perhaps something also we can say we learned from the first project in Rio that this is really something, this comparison is something we always must do because the existing system is also not for free. Um, okay. So here we work towards a dual system. So we have the existing network, what you see here in black, and we have the decentralized system next to it in the areas which are difficult to reach, which are in mountain areas, which are so dense, which are for one or the other reason difficult to reach with the standard system. And so we, may, we worked especially here in this neighborhood in Sape. So we worked on four areas. We went there several times to meet the community. Um, that is um, um, the canal, which is um, already in a much better state. And that's actually why the municipality said you should go there, because now we could make this really good. Um, before, it used to look like this. And so we did um, a diagnosis of the existing situation, so we really mapped this and then we made a proposal of how it would could turn into if you have this um, ecological approach and you integrate several public functions with this useful nature. So that is very similar as in Rio. Um, so this is the, the neighborhood which becomes totally decentralized and you have again in red the septic tanks, thanks the, the filters and the pavilions. And so what we did then is we, we, we talked to people right there, we explained them and so that became really interesting because then we started also a workshop to involve children. We had... Um, we wanted to bring something to the neighborhood that wouldn't be taken away, so we decided to make a mapping that becomes a graffiti. So this wall that you see here was chosen in the favela. We worked with a local graffiti artist which just transferred the map from a piece of paper and lots of new locations were added to this map as the painting was put on the wall. Um, People came, participated, and we realized how important it is for people which don't even appear on the map. I mean, before Google, the, all the favelas, so that is 20% of inhabitants, were white areas on the map. They simply didn't appear. So for those people to have their bahaka or their car wash really on the map was a huge um, step. And so this became the underlayer to work with the children to question their relationship with plants and also their trust in nature. Is nature really able to do this job? So we had some elements which are part of the diagnosis, which is to map the pollution, which map important community elements, a kind of place of opportunity, and to, to map a sort of design aspects. And... Um, yeah, children, of course, they love this um, graffiti. Um, you also see afterwards in the, in the finished map that the river is mapped with um, pollution and places of opportunity are always in parks. Then we had a workshop with the municipality and with the water 
company, so this is actually the next day, presenting also the results from the work with the community. And we looked at how, um, because in fact, design is only 20 to 30 percent. The rest of the uh, step towards implementation is governance. And so we looked at all the obstacles that a solution like this would encounter, that is from the period of um, 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 the elected, which is five years, which is very short to make any changes, to the problems with concessions, where concessions are given for 10 years, so it is in, in, in advance, so it's extremely difficult to come with an innovative, different solution because there is no space in the concessions. And yet, even though the space in the favela is free, so the inhabitants say you can start tomorrow, legally it's the, it's the, um, it's the task of the public services to, to take care of the sanitation. So there is a sort of um, impasse which would need to be um, somehow bridged. Um, yeah, so this is just how um, some of our work was part of the larger um, biennial. So I don't know how I'm with time. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm running quickly through this last project, the um, City of Thousand Tanks that we started um, this year in spring. Um, it's called Water as Leverage, and it's an initiative of the Dutch government, um, together with the Dutch water envoy, Henk Ovink. And we work with a very multidisciplinary team, half in India, um, half in the Netherlands. You see here um, the Indian subcontinent. Chennai is here, and you have here the Bay of Bengal. So apart from four rivers, all of those rivers flow into the Bay of Bengal, they get heated up during the passing through the land. And this leads to this rain pattern, which is the monsoon. So in 100 days every year, all the water comes down. That leads to floating during floods and fighting for drops in summer. Um, Chennai had an extremely interesting way of dealing with the droughts and floods by collecting the water. And this got simply built over by the urban development. So two-thirds of Chennai district is sealed, and that creates the floods um, in the central area. And that has the problem that the water is drained out of the city into the sea as quickly as possible, where it's lost forever. However, the sewage treatment is um, upstream, so all the sewage has to be pumped from here, where the flood occurs outside, so that leads to other difficulties. The freshwater sources are also outside the city. They come from as far as 250 uh, kilometers away. But when you look at the rainfall, then you realize that the rain that falls just on this area here would, in theory, be enough to cover that demand. Sewage so also could be an asset because you could reuse 50% and informal settlements that are often blamed for the, for the dirty rivers are actually accounting only for 0.1%. So we made some diagrams here that put the system of scarcity and of pollution um, Come water coming from outside, going into dirt, like becoming used, dirty into the aquifer, and then just this huge amount of dirty water going into the sea. If our project could look at that and turn it into a more closed cycle with a decentralized system to clean the aquifer and refill it constantly. So the three problems, uh, floods, water supply, and water pollution are interconnected and will need to lead to a proposed solution that prevents floods, floods and droughts with a new decentralized urban system. It anticipates floods and droughts with a uh, building technology that's applied to the existing buildings, and it deals with floods and droughts by a new local governance strategy. So how can we redesign Chennai's urban fabric? Um, we have here the this, this standard... Um, city that um, developed since the, the Middle Ages, where we protected ourselves from nature and we depended yet with all our um, functions on the hinterland. 
that is towards an isotropic city, which is fractally expandable and incorporates nature to solve the problems locally. So this is how Chennai used to look even 50 years ago. Um, you have these lakes, which are called the Erie Principle. You have also below the, the section. So this is, it starts to rain. Those tanks fill up. There is a mound here similar to, to a dike. And so when those mounds are full, then the water trickles down and it's used for agriculture. Agriculture takes place inside um, the lakes as well. The Indian temp uh, temple tanks are filled up during the rain season. They're actually working like inverted pyramids. Then they gradually transmit their water to the aquifer where the houses take it up with individual wells until just uh, before the next monsoon, it is totally dry and the silt can be taken out of the bottom of the temple tank. Now what happened is that this very dynamic urban landscape has been forgotten and often the bottom of the temple, ta temple tanks has been filled with concrete to, um, for, let's say, cosmetic beauty reasons, have, has always the same water level with the same type of ducts at all times. Um, at the same time, they have, walls have been built around the temple tanks so that the water actually can't reach anymore. So the most, one of the most famous temples is the Mylapur tank. You have here the current catchment area of around 140,000 square meter, and that is the catchment area it would need to have to eventually um, refill during one year a radius of 500 meter of the groundwater. And by understanding this logic and using the tanks as barometers, we devised the idea of a city of 1,000 tanks, which is um, replicating this diameter of one kilometer all over the city to eventually um, have certain tools like new water tanks, blue-green canals, rainwater gardens, constructed wetlands, and um, restore the historic water tanks to create an inclusive public space that um, does a lot of infrastructural jobs. So you see here the first aquifer and the second aquifer and how this actually becomes part of the design. We want to work with a strategy similar to Rio where we work from workshops and events to get to know the community, to get to know their cultural ways of working with water to create pilots to harvest rainwater, depollute um, the runoff. Um, you can see that here. And to also make new a new dynamic culture of, of cleaning, which is a very important aspect, to eventually reach an interconnected um, system. Um, our strategy of working, so right now we are in phase one. We are here, we have a workshop, um, with our own team, we have workshop with the municipality and we move forward and the idea is to already in the, feasibilities, in the feasibility phase, which is normally more um, theoretical, to already build some of these pilots to learn and eventually become more sustainable and create an interconnected system. Right now, at the moment, so we're going to Chennai on Thursday, we have uh, found um, five pilot sites. And um, so that's just some impression. This is a low-income housing development that got flooded in 2015 till um, half of the, of the second floor. Um, the part of the garbage is still from the time. That is one of the two biggest rivers in Chennai, the River Adya. And the women in this neighborhood are 50% of their time only busy with getting water to their houses. And so this is, we're also working with the Goethe Institute. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, let me say that uh, Dirk uh, is with us. Tonight, uh, great pleasure to uh, see you again, friend, let me say. <laughs> uh, Dirk is a professor at uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, professor of sustainable design. 
uh, also uh, a research investigator at uh, the Future Cities Laboratory in Singapore. Uh, also our uh, colleague for many years as a professor at uh, ETH Zurich. And uh, I um, also would like to mention a scientific director of the Ethiopian Institute of Architecture, Building Construction and City Development in Addis uh, for several years before moving on to Singapore and to Zurich and to Karlsruhe. And let me also uh, announce uh, uh, that Dirik has a new book out, Addis Ababa Manifesto of, on African Progress, and to remind on the cultivating building materials and building from waste in the, let's say, last uh, three, four years. So, um, uh, uh, I, uh, let me let me start uh, with uh, before handing over to Dirk. I uh, find it really really exciting. Uh, I think it's uh, incredibly um, mm, refined uh, process, ref incredibly worked out uh, process of design, which is uh, really goes beyond. Uh, um, let's say anything that that we used to do 20 years ago <laughs> <Yeah>. in Rotterdam <laughs> which is uh, which makes me really kind of excited about yeah. your uh, trajectory so i i just want to ask uh, when uh, um you know it's a, it's a kind of practice that is fully architectural but also completely um, mm. interdisciplinary in the sense that that uh, you know, you have taken strategies from art, uh, from communication, mm -hmm. from governance, mm -hmm. from infrastructure design, um, um, ecosystem design, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, how how did how did that uh, constellation come together? Or also, where when did you decide? When did you understand that water could be the the kind of organizing element of your practice? Maybe Sylvain. <laughs> Maybe Sylvain wants to talk a bit, yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, we started this with the Emscher Kunz project, where we really um, actually um, realized that um, this type of technique or this type of approach could uh, be very relevant to create public space and also uh, engagement. So these different layers of involvement became totally necessary to our practice. And I think our practice is, is not so much about form or style or, or representation. It's really about all these different layers and, and how, how the form is actually um, uh, reflected by all these different influence in the practice. Yeah, I think our practice is also about um, the processes, as you said, all these different processes. Um, and you do one thing and then you realize you miss another thing and then you do that other thing and then you miss, you know, then one leads to the other and then we started to realize that we need to develop also a skill in visualizing these processes because many of the processes are invisible, like the whole water process is usually invisible and that's perhaps the reason why we have such trouble now at making it more sustainable because we can't see it. So then this became, in a way, a guiding thread, I would say. And now, in a way, again, we hit a boundary when we talk about governance and actually wanting to make it happen. And again, these processes are invisible. So we have to now, with Genai, we come in from a completely different side, which is hopefully more promising than in, in Rio de Janeiro, where we came totally self-initiated by ourselves and in Chennai it becomes actually a wish also of the municipality to do something and there is some more money because of 100 resilient cities so but yeah one leads yeah, and to also the other I think, uh, like, um, like the understanding of um, let's say the the clients or, or the, the uh, kind of uh, more political people that mm -hmm. actually you need now uh, different tool to you know process all this information or to deliver projects so now for water as, as leverage actually the bid, bid selected two teams one team is a very large um, group of engineers and architects 
and the other team is us. But they were very interested in our practice, so from the small mm. to large and back and forth, and this becomes very relevant and very important to, let's say, crack the nut, because the big team cannot mm. crack mm. this very complex, um, let's say, very, um, well, complex, um, <laughs> difficult structures, governance structures, which are in place. Mm. So this could be a, a way in mm. somehow. Well, first of all, thank you, Mulitja and Mark, for inviting me uh, to be here um, in conversation. We have to find out how that uh, works. <laughs> but also I have to say, um, thank the two of you for, I have to say, maybe one of the most inspiring lectures I saw in the last years. Oh, thank you. And that, wow. that, that for me, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I, I, have, I have little to say because everything I dream of was in there. So <laughs> but I would like to start exactly what, what you left because we have the mm. same feeling, right? Mm. Uh, when I look now, the teams I'm working in or mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. um, they're becoming less and less, let's say, yeah. a typical architecture professional mm -hmm. educated people or typical mm -hmm. engineering educated people. That means in the end, um, in our research, we have to be uh, a quarter biologist, a quarter chemist, a quarter architect, a quarter engineer, and then you have other people kind of thing. So mm -hmm. how do you scope with that? So how do mm -hmm. you kind of, you know, make, or mm -hmm. I have the feeling our discipline becomes more and more complex, what you just described, mm -hmm. right? So, so working mm -hmm. in teams, working mm -hmm. with different, uh, mm -hmm. different uh, backgrounds, working with different disciplines uh, mm -hmm. within that, it is not easy, mm -hmm. right? It is, you have to, to learn their language, you have to talk to them, you have mm -hmm. to understand what they're mm -hmm. saying. So that's maybe one complex, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and maybe what I'm most interested in, as we here in an in a educational institution, mm -hmm. How can we teach this? How can we prepare a new generation of architects uh, to be mm -hmm. prepared for this um, in terms of um, the responsibility mm. uh, that, that these generations will carry? I mean, we kind of produced the mess and now we are yeah. asking these people to clean it up, right? Um, so so how, mm. how can we do that? What are new ideas in, in teaching? And then maybe for you, I would like to ask, uh, our institutions, our big institutions usually, they have, you know, above the door when we enter, they have these wonderful, you know, uh, sayings like for the arts or for the beauty. If we would need to reinvent this, you know, today, what would we put on top of our new institutions as a, as a kind of a slogan for this generation that, that have to deal with what we just saw? I, I don't need the oh. microphone, I'm fine. <laughs> I have a luxury version. Um, yeah, to come back to your first question, um, we also feel that we amateurs in many, many disciplines and we probably professional in bringing them together or hopefully becoming more professional because it is very time intensive and it is also an aspect of the profession that has to be recognized as an aspect. So this ability to actually mediate between people and bringing them in contact and enabling them to talk to each other with um, the medium of drawing, actually. Um, that, that is something which needs to be more developed and it is really a practice because it's really by doing, like you cannot design participation, you have to do it. So you have to actually, in India it is very different than in Brazil. And we also realizing now that our team is extremely big. It takes a huge amount of time and we have to see now in the next half a year for the pre-feasibility phase how that pans out. Mm. But somehow the urgency is also very big. So the will is there. And I think that's the important part. So how to teach this, I, I think it's really become yeah part of some of these processes and actually there to talk to people because p and maybe create also more connections between different departments so that it becomes less um, um, pillars. I mean, in the Netherlands, actually, it's even though it's much more integrated, and I think in Brazil, it was probably one of the least integrated parts where you have the Department of Water and the Department of Work and the Department of um, Streets. And they don't share um, their budget, they don't share their people, they don't share the, the data. So 
you know, where to start. It's, it's really, do we start bottom up, uh, constructing that again, or do we start by some technicians, which have also a will to change something, because that's also there. So, yeah, I think um, we have to connect the disciplines, and already from um, a very young age on, um, to work, people like to do one thing, but then when they connect together, they can do much bigger. And architecture students? They conversation. I think yeah. conversation is yeah. like, and the will to understand or to discuss thing and to listen. The, the, yeah. the, the kind of the listening is very important. And also, what is uh, for us what we would say to the new generation is uh, really um, kind of engage in the future with um, with with uh, with um, a, a kind of clear vision of the contextual reality. So um, we have different streams. You know, you have the huh. kind of streams that you see um, coming through all these architectural block with fantastic, um, you know, um, incredible projects everywhere in the world, um, kind of corporate projects. But then you have the reality. So I would say <laughs> um, this conversation, uh, maybe learning from reality, something like this above the new institute <laughs> of uh, uh, the new institute of amateur. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's a bit uh, like this. Like we mm. obviously we have to work with a specialist, but those specialists have to come together um, to define something new. This is a kind of new paradigm in a way. Uh, created by a collective uh, sets of professionals. But, uh, I, I won't let you go on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again, what does it mean? Do we then need mm -hmm. to start teaching uh, participation? How participation mm. works? Do we have to change our curricula? Yeah. Mm. Do we have to understand design as a... You had in your charts always the, the question of time. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so is in the current system uh, the waste that we see? I mean, you showed a lot of images, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where we saw mm -hmm. the, the the plastic waste and we mm -hmm. saw the waste water. And, uh, mm -hmm. So, is this a design mistake? Does it mean that in the end we have to teach what you also showed in your circular diagrams, mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. of metabolism, where, if, for example, the resources uh, that we as architects um, set up to be a house, a mm -hmm. infrastructure, to come back mm. full swing to the circle. So what, what is it that, that we need to add to a curricula for young mm -hmm. engineers, architects, mm -hmm. artists maybe, mm -hmm. um, that prepare them exactly for that mm. world you just described. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing you mm. you're operating on a global scale, mm. right? And even so, you operate on the global you also mentioned that you have to act locally, mm -hmm. right? You cannot have a set of recipes where mm -hmm. you say, well, that works in Rio and therefore mm -hmm. it works in Chennai. So, so wh mm -hmm. what is it that, that in the end mm -hmm. would need to be added to an education of a young architect today? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a sort of, um, let's say, well, if I reflect from our practice, um, when we start either it is Rio, either it is um, Chennai, we look, we do, I would say, six, 70 percent 70 of the time is research. So that is research into the DNA, in a way, of the place. And that is research into the amount, a quantification. It is also about a quantification of the resources you mentioned. and. Th that is maybe just another way of everybody can do it. You can you can see the rainfall data. You can see how much rainfall is falling on the city. You can calculate the amount of liters, and then you see, look at the status quo. It's not impossible, and that is I think the difference. That when you read the news, that then you think, oh, it's impossible. We can never be sustainable. But actually, it's not. So. This, I think, is something we need to learn. We need a roadmap, and I think architecture need to be part of this roadmap because without the roadmap, we don't even know where to go. And if we think it's impossible, then we can never reach it. So somehow to create this roadmap where we want to go and 
what is what is let's say the quantifi quantifiable no quantificable how do you say that? Quantifiable. <laughs> quantifiable thank you the quantifiable amount of resources to build a house where does it come from can we reuse it afterwards um, it's not rocket science but it needs to be done because then we learn from that and we can extrapolate it make it larger the next time so um, I think that. There's also the question of mediation. I mean, the mm. architect who is in construction is mediating also a lot on the construction side, client, etc. But the um, field of expertise and, and kind of interest must, must be extended to governance, to uh, different practices, to politics, to economical, because then you can... In a project, you, it's like pulling strings. So you can pull one string, which is you know quantification, uh, mm -hmm. water. But on the other project, you actually pull another string, and and that's where and you need to find like somehow, it's like many doors, mm. or you know at least in Wonderlands, fall in. Then you you need to open the right door, and then you can uh, go through the project. So it's maybe it's about um, raising curiosity and a kind of awareness and and. Uh, yeah, I think that, that, that there's really this um, mm -hmm. kind of coming out a bit of the technical because the technical is super important, but it's not the only thing which will help changing. I mean, it uh, it strikes. Uh, uh, I I have a, a, a couple of uh, comments, so not uh, not really a question per se, but something that uh, that uh, seemed really apparent and kind of interesting, exciting while you were talking. I mean, on the one hand, that uh, you know, linking to education, that there is. A, there is a kind of met metabolist or even infrastructural approach but at the same time ecological, so there is this notion of hybrid infrastructures, which is also completely, in a way, materialized or mm -hmm. made apparent mm -hmm. in your project, so, mm -hmm. so uh, where the, the natural and mm -hmm. social completely mm. uh, merge. merge. This is a very, very much Anthropocene kind of uh, mm -hmm. issue. The other, the other uh, aspect is that how uh, your, uh, your work illustrates that uh, urbanism could be, you know, like you reinvent it with water. I mean, one could reinvent it along other uh, metabolic uh, flows in urban mm -hmm. environment, obviously energy and, you know, construction materials mm -hmm. and waste mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. food is mm -hmm. complex, you know, water yeah. is just mm -hmm. one, exactly. let's say, but it's food, there are many mm -hmm. foods, right? So in a way, one could mm -hmm. reinvent a city many mm -hmm. times along the, the food mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Um, let's say uh, flows or streams. So, so those uh, those uh, uh, could be incredibly exciting uh, trajectories for for education, for research, mm -hmm. and and so on. And what strikes me also is that you you are working on what what uh, what. Uh, uh, I uh, read recently Jason Moore called, re re I would say you, you're working on, after Jason Moore, reparative ecologies, right? You are, mm -hmm. you are not mm -hmm. building new cities, mm -hmm. right? You are going mm -hmm. into existing fabric and mm -hmm. you are kind of remaking it, mm -hmm. which I think, of course, is, is hugely important and it's self-evident because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we need to go eventually to, to informal mm -hmm. settlements with the project, not mm -hmm. like, like you are mm -hmm. doing. But I think also what is what is exciting is that um, this uh, you know question of what what a city in the future has to be right. It's I I think we are not in the if if we let's say really. Uh, take uh, seriously this Anthropocene debate, it's not about the new cities that we will build, it's about how the existing cities also will adapt, right? And this is also the, the recognition that, I think the water illustrates it beautifully, you know, that this kind of uh, uh, rigid uh, top-down systems are, are, you know, often expensive, but they are also, um, uh, they are also, fragile right they are they are harder to to maintain they are they are you know 
they also organize the kind of power differently, right? Power in urban development, right? So this kind of mm. democratization <laughs> that mm -hmm. uh, that the city, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this kind of enabling mm -hmm. aspect of, of mm -hmm. this project is really uh, fascinating, right? So in a way, it's a, it's a kind of a democratizing project, right? Giving giving the, the kind of resources or water back to the neighborhood, no? So uh, so I uh, I find this uh, I find this really inspiring. I I also want to ask you. I mean, do you maybe just just one question in the in the end of this uh, uh, thoughts? I mean, do you? Do you do you do you see a possibility in your practice to engage with another resource like uh, let's say energy <laughs> or uh, I mean I could I could imagine that water is just enough in <laughs> the end right maybe we, we need a few different architectural practices around <laughs> around those diff because because the, one needs a really huge expertise in order to to do what you're doing right i can i can i know that that it took many years right <laughs> yeah it took uh, <laughs> took some time um i mean now in india obviously water and waste are totally linked um because the waste uh, leads to pipes being stuck um, it needs to water not being able to flow it needs to water becoming extremely polluted and now we work with an expert on um, microeconomic waste um, mm -hmm. recycling in india so let's see where where that um, leads to to pick up to 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 see which stream touches that but eventually yes you could of course work with many but you need a certain <laughs> specialization um, Let's see how 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 we will grow. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, and but th 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 those projects are quite <laughs> inspiring, not only in terms of the informal community and stuff. Now we have a, a project uh, in Brazil, uh, so the client was very inspired by the exhibition, and uh, and basically they're asking us to uh, design a new eco eco villa um, you know co i mean condominio with a uh, hundred villas so in in this one so it's a semi rural area so to apply the same kind of methodology uh so uh, not in a context but kind of make our new context which would be somehow uh, ecologically sustainable so there we work with waste we work with energy so it's, it's, as you say, a lot of different uh, fields. Probably the governance issue will be much easier mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's more contractual. You kind of have mm -hmm. already those structures in place mm -hmm. when people enter the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a different type of role, but mm -hmm. you, you, you have uh, the same streams which you mm -hmm. describe. So, I mean, we don't see like difference, like our way in was really the water, but n yeah. now it's also a question of uh, resources and time. Yeah. Uh, as you say mm -hmm. on the on the Indian project, so the the waste is a very important issue, and as part of uh, one guy of our team is uh, he's a specialist in waste and also microeconomy. So actually uh, making a new economy out of, out of the waste. So we he is part of our team. So we. We have to push them a bit now, because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're quite far away from mm -hmm. India, so mm -hmm. it's, a, uh, as we say, a totally different culture of working. Mm -hmm. So you need to um, use different uh, tactics and strategies to kind of engage people. But uh, yeah, we still have uh, six months to go, so we have a, a lot of deadlines because the Dutch government is controlling the <laughs> process, you see, so <laughs> it's a series of workshops and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because then... Yeah, and to come back to your other question of decentralized versus centralized and what can the new generation add to that, um, I think it's extremely interesting to work with digital media when you speak about decentralization wow. because there's a big amount of communication and a big amount of monitoring which needs to happen. And so that... Of course, it's, it's less big, so it's less um, top-down, so we don't build huge pipes anymore, but we still have to monitor if yeah. it's working. And we still need some amount of control, which can only be um, given by the government, this amount of continuity you need. So in this, let's say, um, merge, I think there is some new tools which need to be developed, um, which, which 
haven't been because why this hasn't happened before like I don't know 100 um, years ago um, in fact it was I think um, a woman from the ETH which gave a lecture at the Berlache and she talked about um, when water got centralized mm -hmm. and that it was at that time more or less 100 years ago it was seen as the new thing that will democratize public space because finally we don't see the water anymore. Finally mm. it's underground and it's solved. And now we can have proper roads. So now we at 100 years later we think okay maybe it was not perfect for some reasons we have to change again. And But that I found really interesting that at that time they really thought that's democracy and now we think it's top down, it's not us. So Great. <coughs> Let's uh, pass to the audience, Mark Angeli. Well, thank you very much for the lecture. I agree with, with Dirk for very inspiring what, what you showed us. And also there is optimism in it and hope about uh, the next generation where it's, it's going to go. I want to pick up on one sentence that Eva said. You said, if nature, uh, is nature able to do the job? Mm -hmm. Question mark. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what is interesting about your work is that it's, it's, it designs nature, it produces uh, nature, it deploys nature in order to achieve a certain, certain goal. And maybe this is not far away from what Melissa talked about the uh, Anthropocene. You know, if, if man has managed to be seen as a geological force that mm -hmm. uh, is, is changing you know, everything on, on this globe, maybe one of our long-term objectives would have to be the production, the production of nature, which is not on, on our agenda by any, any means. No, mm -hmm. We still see you know, man and nature as separate, separate forces. Um, and if this is the case, mm -hmm. th this would be one of the key insights mm -hmm. of uh, the seminar for me, that mm -hmm. you know, if, if, um, if you ask about you know, the agency of design, if the agency of design is to reconstruct nature. Okay. That will be an extremely interesting uh, provocation. Because we see ourselves at the Department of Architecture that we do you know, urban design, we do architecture, we do buildings, but we never thought of that, you know, by the way, we are creating a new nature that we now call the Anthropocene. Mm. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next question. <laughs> Um, thank you. I want to ask that if if you apply this in a large scale, maybe more people would include it and there is a huge complex rules, maybe all of us should follow and make it as a loop. But how to make the system still work, maybe even a long term, not just temporarily? Hmm. Um, okay, what is needed for that is, let's say, if you free yourself from the larger top-down system, you need to take some responsibility yourself. So the citizen will need to be responsibilized, responsibilized to a certain extent, and that is, comes back to what I just said before, that we found it convenient in the past that somebody takes this responsibility from us and supplies us with energy and with water and prevents us from floods. But now we start to question this because is it really working? Will we really have energy or will we have gas or will Russia switch off the gas? And so maybe now it becomes interesting to become responsible and say, no, I put my own um, energy on my roof because then I know I have it, but I have to take care of it. It's, um, it doesn't come for free. So it is possible, but you need, it's, it's not for free. It's like there is a certain amount of time, but you gain freedom for that. If that answers your question. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, second question, sorry. <laughs> And I, I think that sometimes the artists and the architects usually be viewed as a part of gentrification. Mm -hmm. and, but on your project, there is something totally different concept. And do you think it is still a solution that we can make the city more sustainability by showing people how bad those gentrification are, is? And there is another possibility to make things better? Yeah. The 
if I understand, is it a question or uh, yeah, it's statement? like ask for your opinion or um, do you want to? Yeah, and the this this let's yeah, say it's like do you um, see this system more as sort of undoing the city or how it's would like you we see it? in showing something by. Mm -hmm. It's like we use our design mm -hmm. to show mm -hmm. how bad those things are, and there is a possibility, like yeah. what you did. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah, I think what our experience is, if we show people the designs that happen in São Paulo and in Rio, that people feel actually empowered because we take their space seriously. We don't propose another building, but we say you could change this and that and actually it would mean gentrification we cannot say yeah. everything which improves neighborhoods is gentrification because then people live in shit literally and we don't improve it so that's unhealthy it's totally unsustainable so we must do something that gives people the tools to maintain their own space so as, but this is a huge challenge it's, uh, it's huge mm. that because you 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 mentioned in the in the king's cross uh, mm -hmm. pond this fact that the pond had to stop right and mm -hmm. that, that that was on mm -hmm. the um, mm -hmm. you know part mm -hmm. of the the long term vision mm -hmm. of the private developers so mm -hmm. so it links to the previous question in the sense mm -hmm. to to try to understand uh, how does this uh, type of approach linked to our current kind of geographies of public and private or the the state and the investor let's say in yeah. a, in a, mm. you yeah. know what we mm. consider the kind of a mainstream uh, mm -hmm. urban development or redevelopment process mm -hmm. right so in in fact uh, what what is your experience so far i mean who in the end would have to invest into those infrastructures or those new ecologies and how do you think they could be maintained over a, a longer mm -hmm. period of time? Mm -hmm. And also, where is mm -hmm. the opportunity in the kind of in the in the systemic, uh, yeah. uh, uh, let's say, <laughs> uh, approach? Going right there where it hurts, right? <laughs> um, so, okay, I think now we talked about microeconomy. So in India, we trying it, it works if you manage to also create a business for some people. It doesn't need to be a huge amount of profit, but that some people can live from it. So that is if waste, which happens right now in the Anthropocene, that waste becomes something that is very valuable. Mm. So if we're able to take the sewage, which has a lot of very valuable, um, whatever... Um, me heavy metals, um, anything which is in there, and we sort of undo this into the elements and we're able to do that with other ways, then it becomes a value and then it becomes an economy and then it becomes a sustainable process. So mm -hmm. in sort of thinking it from the other way around, we can create these economies which then sustain the system, but we don't, I don't have it ready, the answer. I just, we're working on it, yeah. It is a real... Mm -hmm. um, it is a real topic, um, mm. you know, uh, privatization uh, versus gentrification uh, versus instrumentalization versus what is public, what is private. It, it's really um, uh, a big question. Um, we could uh, talk about each project mm -hmm. with this <laughs> a kind of lens and kind of go a bit deeper into it, but. Uh, let's say if we talk about mm. the pond, mm. that was that's a very interesting mm. one because then uh, that's a so private developer uh, who was uh, granted. Basically, the site before was a, a public, uh, so Camden Council. Uh, this private developer bought the site, but they had uh, like basically a list specification of what they should do by law in order to develop the site. So provide schools, provide green spaces, provide, uh, so art was section 106, which they had to do this art uh, program, that's our section. Um, the, I mean, 
the development is very impressive because they managed to kind of bring a lot of hype and a kind of semi-generous, um, uh, let's say, um, public space and, uh, and, and access to the site. So it's not a condominium, but actually the site is private. So what people think or perceive as public is private. So, so you know, private... Uh, uh, yeah, cleaning, so private, uh, everything, so security, yeah. cameras, and stuff like this. Mm. So, um, the, the, like our project uh, came uh, within this um, a kind of constellation, and somehow it opened a new um, vision. Somehow, and people uh, uh, didn't really understand the project as temporary. The, the project for them was a public work because it was uh, next to a park, and they thought this is public. So you know, why does this project have to go? So they kind of somehow start uh, to fight for it by doing these petitions and, and they even went to the council. So there was a special, you know, kind of complaint to the council mm -hmm. say we want to keep this facility. We, we are even ready to run it. Mm -hmm. But let's say the contracts uh, which was running the site is like saying, but the, the council said, well, you know, it's not public land. So the owner of this land has to decide if he keeps it or not. So you, you see here that um, if I answer your question is like maybe by doing this type of project, probably opening a bit more the, 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 the realm of the, or the possibility of, of, of future use so that maybe this type of use are integrated really in the um, in, in like the, the requirements of what a developer should do so uh, that, and then we it returns back mm -hmm. to then the yeah. policy making uh, public um, uh, policies because when when you actually make a deal between public and private you you know you have contracts so you have and that comes in there where you have to yeah, specify and sometimes the temporary can help Exactly. Like uh, in for the King's Cross Pond Club, if it would be permanent, impossible. Like it was the first public um, natural swimming pond in the UK ever, and we had like public what account. what if a person what if a person dies in the pool? It's full of blood. What if uh, children pee in the pond? It, like we got we went through these crazy questions. And so, okay, we, let's make it per, like temporary. Let's see, and then you know, then let's let's do. It. Eventually, we got all the parties on board. Maybe also because it was a private client, like the funding was secure, and once the client decided to go for it, then they went for it. And they, interestingly, they paid it from their marketing um, department, and so they invested a sum, but. Um, their visitor numbers on their website went in the months the pond opened from 5,000 to 100,000. So for them was like, that's it, it worked. So now we can, <laughs> you know, break it down. And there was also this notion, when you talk about community, the, the developer was extremely afraid of community. Like we got excited when we heard there's a petition and the client got really afraid because there was an element they couldn't control. And, and so this is what the public normally deals with. So, and meanwhile, this community was a lawyer, a doctor, um, a mediator, a very, very educated um, people. Uh. Yeah, to, to continue on this one, I think there's an interesting thought. Um, in the idea, number one, what I think is very honest of you to mm. put the finger in the, you know, in the dark spot. <laughs> That, that this question of ecology is, of course, coming down always to the question of economy, right? Mm -hmm. So if nobody sees um, a benefit mm -hmm. in this, mm -hmm. might it be in social terms or in, in monetary terms, mm -hmm. uh, it is hard to convince people mm -hmm. that this is actually something, you know, for long term mm -hmm. and not only for, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. a PR gag. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's very interesting because I think um, that requires from us to think about new economical models. Yeah. And what I was intriguing by the, the, the model you mm -hmm. showed of the favea in, in, in Rio, I think mm -hmm. it was, with this lung, like almost mm -hmm. like a lung, that this all of a sudden gives um, um, a kind of a typology, an architectural typology that, that you guys are researching on for the last uh, I don't know, decades, a complete new value, 
right? That all of mm. a sudden, uh, this favea is not seen anymore as only a, a negative element in the city fabric, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden it delivers mm. a service. In that case, a service mm -hmm. of clean water, mm -hmm. right? And the question is, mm -hmm. who is paying for this service? Mm -hmm. And that is yeah. what, what I'm getting yeah. more and more around. Yeah. That, you know, we, we, we are on actually in architecture on a complete different track. We are mm -hmm. talking about passive, right? We're talking about mm -hmm. passive house, passive energy, passive oh, yeah. ventilation, passive, 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 passive. But what you showed mm -hmm. is an active model. Mm -hmm. That means that this organism right, that you showed is in an active mode of doing something for society which nobody yet is willing to pay for. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. So I think hand in hand in that discussion, we cannot neglect one or the other, right? So mm -hmm. it needs to be a complete mm -hmm. kind of yeah, hand in hand uh, action between uh, ecological um, mm -hmm. approaches within an economical system, a feasible mm -hmm. economical system. And I think that I agree with that is the mm -hmm. hardest point to mm -hmm. achieve and to invent a new service economy mm -hmm. that is actually you know, paying for this in the end. Mm -hmm. And I, I find it very interesting right now, I don't know if you heard about that, in Germany there's a new company, um, they are delivering right now to you electrical power, but they don't want to be paid for delivering uh, the power to your house, they want to be paid for building solar panels, um, you, can, you can buy 30 by 30 centimeter plus, they call that a pizza carton, <laughs> <laughs> you can buy as many as you want and you're only investing in the in the primary infrastructure mm -hmm. and after that you can receive the power that one panel is is kind of producing mm -hmm. for free that that because you know you are you are helping to build up mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. infrastructure which in the end becomes an active service element right. for society mm -hmm. so there are hints in this economy ah, yeah, but i think we architects mm -hmm. need to connect to this right we, mm -hmm. we have to find these holes mm -hmm. to make the favea yeah. part of that service no? yeah yeah that's a very good notion yeah i find it very in the, 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 let's say this is an immediate service yeah. that is delivered and, and the other thing now, which we're looking at for India, for instance, is the future negative externalities. So we have insurances, for instance, that pay for damage done through um, floods or heavy rains. Um, now this, let's say, does a project like this also work as an insurance that you would actually not have to pay for the future negative externalities? That, that's another, because you might have to pay a lot, but who is continuing to pay for this? Yeah. Like, how much will the damage be? Yeah. Actually, that's what was quite interesting in the Sao Paulo Biennale. So um, this guy who came from Sabespi, he was very interesting and interested uh, on this drawing of the pipes uh, versus constructed wetland. And he actually said, we, we are ready to pay for those pilot because we have to be clear, those places where you are working, we just simply cannot deal with them. It, it, you know, some places are mm. not possible to access, we, we cannot do it. So, uh, the question was, um, again, a kind of difficult question, which is the uh, con contractual and, uh, you know, how are we paid? You know, is it, um, is it the kind of, yeah. uh, so they, mm -hmm. they ask us, Oh, do you still have budget in your grants from the Netherlands to work <laughs> on this? And we say, no, it's over. You know, like <laughs> the Biennale is over. This is our, and, and then they say, okay, ah, oh, mm, we have to. But then the problem was also the tendering. Like, mm -hmm. how do you mm -hmm. come in as mm -hmm. an external mm -hmm. advisor for this type of work? They didn't want it to be a public tender. They wanted to work directly with us. So they say, well, if you get your fees together from the other side, then we can pay for the the work and the, 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 the pilot. But so that's also a, an issue, which is mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, how do you come in those public works? The and process how of how infrastructure is actually exactly. tended. Yeah. Yeah. The concessions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. all this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's difficult <laughs> situation. But, uh, yeah. Okay, we have <laughs> <laughs> good. We have a couple of more questions. Shall we 
Merci. Thank you, Hans. <laughs> uh, thank you for the lecture. I think it was extremely uh, exciting to see this. this uh, to see, actually, I, I'm going to reclaim architecture as a credit um, for, for what you do. I think that's that's really um, very <laughs> exciting for us. And um, my, my question is, maybe you, you partially answered it, but I still want to uh, maybe put really a finger on it, because it seems to me like you're long-term agenda is a little bit more um it, it you didn't really totally lined it up you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, the idea that some of the work that you do is related to community but also uh, perhaps policy and i would like to to go back to that project that you just talked about which is the you said it was villas right um and i'm just uh, interested in what is your expectation on that project um also because not so long ago uh we visited uh, a very distressing uh, new city in, in uh, Egypt. And when you were talking about um, how uh, we, we have to deal with these questions of water and, and so on and so forth, I think that there are a lot of things that are being built which are not even uh, not, not even thinking about all of that. And, and I feel like there is a certain futility in our, um, let's say, in, in how our, our discipline deals with this. Which is why I think that the the project that you mentioned about uh, the private developer doing villas and being interested in bringing in these kinds of um, uh, systems is exciting because it, it talks about a different scale, which I think for, for me is the most uh, promising, like the, the, the question of the scale. So I, I would like to, to hear a little bit more about maybe your long-term agenda, not only just that, that project, but if you can see some kind of um yeah like like long term vision um, um, uh, yes i mean maybe we can talk a we can talk a bit more about the um, the story of this project uh so so we got approached by um this person who uh, has bought a site in a kind of in the middle of nowhere basically uh, so it's in uh, 400 kilometers north of Rio, rural area, but there's a potential and uh, somehow his own story uh, leads him to invest in this uh, site, which is... Yeah, but we can say his own story that he used to be a marketing manager for Apple, Latin America. Okay. So, like, huge. And he devised a strategy by which he said, we're not only looking at Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, and Brasilia, so we're not only looking at the huge cities, but let's look at the countryside, and actually how many millions are living in the countryside, and, or in these kind of smaller cities of 100,000 people. And so Apple became really successful with this, so his idea now, we, we, he, he is somebody who has many ideas, so we have to see if that works. But so now he wants to, he said, okay, let's go to the rural area and let's develop this in the rural area. So that's where he is coming from. Basically, we started the project. Um, and apparently on the, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the plan, the, the, the plan uh, we could develop this type of projects, but actually it turned out that it was rural and then we couldn't do it there, you know, because it's a rural area. But uh, in seeing our plan, the municipality got really excited by uh, this plan because it was giving space to nature, uh, dealing with all these uh, different cyclic systems. And uh, as probably you saw in Egypt, uh, in Brazil, there are a lot of uh, dev new development which are building horror, basically. So, uh, so for them, it was very exciting. And then they decided to change their plans. So to make actually the plan a policy now. So they, 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 they went into a, a process of voting. So it's, uh, you know, kind of quite small. So they, they, they did this three months process to actually change their plan. So now the plan is changed. Um, so we resubmitted the, the, the plan again. Um, and let's see, I mean, the, the investor is also uh, looking for partner investors and talking to several people all, all around Brazil to see if they can invest in this. But yeah, the, the, the idea is to really um, develop certain models which could be um, applied and demonstrated because when we say villa, it is not like the luxurious villa that you see published everywhere in, you know, kind of Sao Paulo, super 
nice uh, it is a medium income villa so we also have a quite tight budget but we are uh, confident that we can <laughs> do something very nice with mm -hmm. the budget they give us so yeah Uh, I would also like to uh, to ask uh, related to scale. I think it fits to what you described. At one point, you said that um, the favelas are pollut polluting zero point something percent. Uh, in, India. in India, yeah. In India. Mm -hmm. it, that was in India. Mm -hmm. That it, that the percentage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there is a different. So there is yes. a. Mm -hmm. Okay, but still, it kind of uh, made me uh, ask: Who are other polluters? Hmm. Are there possibilities hmm. to to find strategies to work with them? Hmm. Uh, I'm thinking about industry probably a lot, which also kind of relates to economic kind of different hmm. economic models. Um, uh, in how far is it possible to to engage, to discuss, to to mm -hmm. to develop models which might not be hmm. also related to public space? Mm -hmm. I think because yeah. I saw a lot of public space, and I'm hmm. thinking if there is another right. opportunity to kind of produce mm -hmm. um, to produce uh, other programs in a way mm -hmm. and then I'm also in the Indian example I got uh, interested in how far um, this problematic of flooding might also relate to a bigger scale even you showed this huge mm -hmm. drawing where there are like thousands mm -hmm. of tanks probably mm -hmm. they are all gone not the ones that are mm -hmm. missing in the city but there is also these programs of large scale interlinking of rivers in India mm -hmm. which kind of destroyed this whole system or there are also these small-scale pro or kind of individualized problems of the mm. of the well, which mm -hmm. suddenly kind of made it possible to extract so much mm -hmm. groundwater that this mm -hmm. is also a kind of a totally new. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering about mm. this kind of along these lines. Mm. I don't know. Maybe it's. A yeah. So okay. Let's start with the. Also. Ah yeah. Okay. I hope we can remember. Well, it goes <laughs> a bit in the same direction. I saw. First of all, also I really liked very much your presentation, and I happened to see two biowater treatment plants in India a couple of years ago, maybe ten years ago, the first time, and they were beautiful. It was really a piece of landscape in mm -hmm. the city. This was in Gujarat, in Guj. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, mm -hmm. uh, and then I went back five years later and they didn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously mm -hmm. the operation and maintenance, mm -hmm. it's not that nature works on its own. Mm -hmm. It still needs mm -hmm. uh, technical competences, organizational skills, financial mm -hmm. uh, resources, mm -hmm. because it didn't work anymore. And, and mm -hmm. I, I thought, well, That's yeah, it was really sad question. to see yeah. that. Mm -hmm. this is, and India, by mm -hmm. the way, has a lot of Technology is very eco-friendly, mm. like uh, mm. biogas mm -hmm. was a big issue, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a bit, so mm -hmm. uh, how could that element mm -hmm. of ensuring the sustainability, building in an, o uh, an operation and maintenance uh, plan uh, that mm -hmm. uh, includes the technical skills, mm -hmm. or, so the educational component, but of course also the institutional framework for that uh, uh, be, integrated mm. in the process so that on a long term mm. it's sustainable and then well, regarding Chennai it's also as I lived in Chennai 30 <laughs> years ago actually <laughs> so I, Adiyar, I lived in Adiyar <laughs> and the tanks of course have been in decay for a very long time mm -hmm. and that's what you mentioned also but also the very reason, I mean, the natural, what basically is really the problem, that the, ver the natural drainage system is completely damaged mm -hmm. and cannot be restored so easily because mm -hmm. every road, every every house is actually obstructing the natural drainage mm -hmm. system. So you almost have to demolish the city in order to restore the drainage system. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely, well, I mean, to some extent, mm -hmm. we need an already highly urbanized mm -hmm. area that becomes mm -hmm. impossible. I mean, the, yeah, the floods mm -hmm. are caused by the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. In that sense, mm -hmm. the flood is really an expression mm -hmm. of a, of of of, of mm -hmm. a, a problem that is caused by the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So, how are you dealing mm -hmm. with that? Because maybe some the Milapol tank, maybe yeah. because mm -hmm. it has such an important cultural mm -hmm. meaning, I think people would be willing even to give up something in order mm -hmm. to restore the, the the that particular tank. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Tamil Nadu is really the country of tanks mm -hmm. and. Uh, and they are, have been in decay for many, many mm. years. And, mm. 
and not just because of the infrastructure around mm -hmm. it, but also because the relation with the private wells mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. have lead, led to a whole individualization exactly. and the privatization mm -hmm. of water management mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that has really, uh, yeah, it, it's yeah, re-establishing mm -hmm. that for a project that is durable and, and, and not just nice mm -hmm. when it's finished, yeah. it's really very, very yeah. challenging. Yeah, so what you're mentioning, actually, it's even happening in the Netherlands. So even in the Netherlands, there was a constructed wetland um, close to, uh, I don't know, Almere or Hilversum, which has worked as long as the person um, that actually devised it and was in the municipality to take care of it, as long as that person was working. When that person went into pension, then that job fell off because there was actually no job for it. And I think that's something that has to change, that systems like this then have to be written into um, policies. Ha so th that actually somebody, not only the architect who's designing them, but also the person in the municipality who is taking care is paid for it and has to do it as part of the job list. If that person doesn't exist, then the system will eventually fail. Um, so it's about building capacity? Mm -hmm. And by doing those pilots, you can build capacity because you, you can um, demonstrate that it works and you can also uh, demonstrate a certain practice. And this is yeah. what you're talking mm -hmm. about, this uh, practice of maintenance that mm -hmm. you do anyway for any type of system. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you maintain a mm -hmm. pump, you can also maintain mm -hmm. a constructed wetland. Like which on is the other hand, simple. in Sweden or the US, in Oregon, they're very good um, with water systems. They have devised decentralized um, rainwater collection and treatment system, and they keep on working because there the city is really behind it. So it, there are good examples also. And let's say to connect that to Hans's questions about industrialization or industries. Um, and private. And private. We have that connects also to that because now we, in, in Chennai, we have, of course, large industrial polluters, um, coloring, uh, whatever, clothes dyeing, all this stuff. But is also going BMW, in the river. by the way. Also BMW. Um, they are not only polluting, but they're also using huge amounts of fresh water and they could e easily use recycled water. Like, it would be no problem at all. And that's really where you have to start working with those industries, um, not only in pointing fingers and say, you would, you know, you're doing a bad job, but also saying how you could make it better. And so now for India, we're developing... Um, recharge wells or tanks on different scales and we're not developing them we just they are already on the market you have very small individual ones which look like a, i don't know one and a half meter diameter and it's a drum which goes five meter deep and this is recharging from a roof so even if the roof is not green or not sustainable you can recharge directly and you can expand that to um, larger lakes, so we're also working on a regional plan where you would have like a sort of green belt you would start to have to take up the flooding that comes from elsewhere, that comes from outside, because in 2015 it rained a lot outside the city, and so so long until those uh, lakes that are still existing, those dams were completely like to the brink, and the city decided at night to open these gates out of desperation. They hadn't announced it before, and then that's when the huge flooding happened. So um, it's true, totally true. You have to start outside because it rains everywhere, and you have to create absorption, forests. Um, it's, it's all not rocket science, and that comes back to the question of um, Charlotte. She's gone now, but um, this long-term vision is that when we did Emscher Kunst, we actually realized it's common sense. And so since then, we sort of obsessed by proving that it's possible to make it happen because it's so simple in a way. So to create different type of tools and different kind of spaces and to see that, for instance, in Chennai, what you also have is that um, many politicians have vested interests in the system as it's run right now. Water is scarce, and when something is scarce, you have a sort of mafia that exploits that. So there is illegal wells which go now already into the second aquifer, 
and which once you deplete it, it's gone forever. It won't refill anymore. And, and so only by creating again an abundance, you can work against um, the mafia in a way. So that, that was where we, we started this thinking. Um, and what we can say is it, it effectively knowledge is there. Mm. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. basically they're all there. But it's uh, about the dynamic of the program, about uh, this kind of working together, so to uh, kind of uh, create this synergy, which we hope will uh, probably change a bit the perception, especially from the municipality, that thing can happen. So in, in, in that, I mean, you saw the amount of people which are in our team, so they're all very uh, specific experts, which, which are already have uh, experience in practicing uh, those techniques. So now it's about bringing everybody together and try to devise this, this uh, yeah, as you said, this roadmap mm. to, um, uh, to set uh, in motion uh, this project. Uh, so effectively, you have uh, millions of different typologies, but in a way, if you... Um, take um, one of these uh, technology and you uh, kind of build it in a house somewhere on on a, on a road somewhere and you demonstrate that this works. Possibly the municipality will be inclined mm. to commission more. So our plan is always that's a bit what you show. It's like mm. going from small to big, big to small, and mm. you, you use this. Um, uh, small pilot to trigger um, confidence uh, that it can work. Good, 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 good. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I'm really uh, excited, really <laughs> grateful for this talk and I hope uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking you, you're saying okay, I, I, let's use the small pilot and, and hmm you know, prove that it can work and I hope we can do this really fast enough <laughs> <laughs> to, to, have a, to have a huge impact to, to, to reinvent but our, our practice. Of, the students when of course. Their mother countries or they can also start it. Of course, so, so I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really impressed by the, the kind of uh, magnitude of the, of the project that you have in fact proposed right? <laughs> through, yeah, through, crazy, through yeah. the pilots that you, that you showed. So thanks so much. Thank you, Eva, for thank a great you, thank talk. You. Thank you, Sylvain. Thank you, Dirk, for being here. Let's continue the conversation uh, next, Monday. next Monday, exactly. <laughs> see, you, see you there. Thank you.